Okay, so today I'm going to explain how to complete your Cask of Amontillado reading assignment. So this assignment is actually a combination of two previous assignments that we used to do in past years. Before, we used to have students do reading questions and then do post-reading questions. And instead of doing that, we're combining them all together into one bigger assignment. So this whole assignment is worth 41 points. So think about the fact that normally your quiz, like your quiz for Most Dangerous Game, was 25 points. Your quiz for this story is going to be 35 points. This is worth even more than that. So please make sure that you are following these directions and completing all of the elements of the assignment that you are supposed to. Uh, this will help you get a good grade as well as understand what is happening in the story. So go ahead and go to slide number two. Okay, so on slide number two, you will have tasks that are labeled in arrows like this. You must complete all the tasks to earn credit, okay? So sometimes it'll tell you to highlight something or to underline something. Um, the text will be over here on this side of the screen, okay? And it gives you a reminder of how to highlight text. If you wanna highlight something, you select it. And then you go up here to this little highlighter and you choose your highlight color, okay? So, that's just a reminder, okay? Um, as you read the story, you wanna highlight any words that you don't know in orange. Um, on average, each person has at least three words in orange by the end of the story. Don't feel bad if you have more than that, though. Um, it's just places for you to identify where you might need help with some words. Sometimes you will see a question in a box like this. So you will type your response into the box. Your responses need to be in complete sentences to receive credit. And if you run out of room, you can either change the size of the text or you can um, insert a comment or do something like that to make it bigger. Okay, so we are actually going to do the first couple of pages together and we will go over um, the answers as well um, to get you started. So go ahead and um, what I would recommend doing is open this video in one tab and kind of like make it small and scoot it over to the side and then have your assignment in another tab um, taking up the rest of your screen so that you can pause and restart as you need to. Okay, so this is The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. And like you can see right here, this is the text and then these are the questions and the uh, activities that we will do as we read. Okay, so my suggestion is to always first preview what the questions are and then read the text. So the questions are first, what do you think the narrator means by the thousand injuries and what does this apply about how long Fortunato has wronged the narrator? I'm also going to be looking for an example of dramatic irony and then I'm also going to be looking for the meaning of this quote. Okay, so let's get started. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. Okay, so already from this first passage, you can definitely tell that Edgar Allan Poe has a much different writing style than uh, Most Dangerous Games author Richard Connell. Okay, uh, keep in mind he's writing in the 1800s, so his um, syntax and the way that he puts his sentences together is just a little bit more complicated. So let's kind of break this down so uh, we can see what we have going on so far. So hopefully you notice first and foremost that we have a first person narrator, right? It's saying I had born as best I could. And we know that the narrator has an issue with someone. Who's that person? Hopefully you identified that it's Fortunato. Okay, so we have the thousand injuries of Fortunato. I had born as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. So there right away you have your conflict. Fortunato has done something to our narrator, right? Uh, he has injured him, it says, a thousand times. Um, this doesn't mean physical injuries, right? It's more like um, he has done bad things, uh, you know, thousands of times to me. But when he insults me, then I'm going to vow revenge, okay? So these are like little things that he did, but now he's insulted me, and so I'm vowing to get revenge. 
Um, this right here is a great example of hyperbole. Okay, was it really a thousand injuries? Probably not. Okay, so over here we have our first question. What do you think the narrator means by the thousand injuries? What does this imply about how long Fortunato has wronged the narrator? So go ahead and pause the video and think about it for a second, and then we will talk about a possible answer. Okay, so hopefully you came up with something along the lines of the thousand injuries um, mean just the different ways that Fortunato has wronged the narrator. I think, oops. So I'm gonna write, I think the thousand injuries means that Fortunato has wronged the narrator over and over. Okay. What does this imply about how long this has been going on? This implies that it has been going on for years, right? Because to accumulate thousands of injuries, it's definitely taken some time. Okay, next, we need to highlight an example of dramatic irony in green. So keep in mind that dramatic irony is when the audience knows something that the character does not. Okay, so take a second to look back over here, pause the video if you need to, and think of where we could see some dramatic irony. Okay, good. So hopefully you have uh, selected this section right here. You who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. So that means that we, the audience, knows that Fortunato wants to get revenge, but he hasn't uttered a threat. So he hasn't said anything to Fortunato. So Fortunato does not know that Montressor wants to get revenge on him. So we're going to highlight that in green because that is dramatic irony. We, the audience, know that Mont the narrator, we don't know his name yet, <laughs> uh, that he wants to get revenge on Fortunato, and Fortunato does not know. So everything that the narrator does, keep in mind that he hates Fortunato, that he wants to get revenge on Fortunato, and that Fortunato has no idea. All right, the last question on this page. When the narrator states, I must not only punish, but punish with impunity, what does he mean? you might want to look up the word impunity. So I'm gonna do that. If I'm not sure what impunity means, I'm gonna Google search it, and I'm going to find that it means exemption from punishment or freedom from the injurious consequences of an action. So it basically just means that um, you are not going to be punished. So going back, what does it mean when Montressor says, I must not only punish Fortunato, the narrator, when he says, I must not only punish Fortunato, but punish with impunity, what does he mean? Does he want to get caught? No, he definitely doesn't want to get caught. So the narrator means that he wants to punish Fortunato, but not get caught and punished himself. Okay. All right, let's go on to slide number four. So um, this whole beginning part just sort of gives us the introduction to our conflict, uh, introduction to the fact that Fortunato does not know that the narrator is mad at him, and then he's just talking about sort of the nature of revenge here at the bottom. Okay, so on page four, does Fortunato have any clue he has wronged the narrator? What from the text gives you this idea? We're gonna highlight characterizing phrases in pink, and then we are going to uh, look at what is Fortunato's expertise. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. 
For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and American mil Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack, but in the matters of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. So our first question, which is up here, so it's kind of in this first part of the text. Does Fortunato has any, have any clue that he has wronged the narrator? So does Fortunato know that the narrator is mad at him? Good. Hopefully you can tell from the text that the narrator, do, or the Fortunato does not know that the narrator is mad at him. And where can we find that in the text? Right up here it says, it must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. It says that he continued to, I continued to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. Immolation basically means destruction. So Fortun, uh, Fortunato and the narrator, when they meet, uh, the narrator is still nice to him. He's smiling, but inside he's thinking like, oh, I can't wait to just destroy you. So for our top question, we are going to use a complete sentence. And let's go ahead and say... Fortunato does not know that he has wronged the narrator. In the text, it states, uh, neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. Okay, so that is your text evidence. Then he starts to describe Fortunato. So these characterizing phrases are phrases that help us understand the character's perspective or personality. So we're going to highlight in pink things that help us to understand who Fortunato is and who our narrator is. So what can we tell about Fortunato? It says that he has a weak point. Okay. We also hear in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. So I'm going to highlight that. Because that kind of shows me that he's a powerful person. I'm highlight that in pink. And then it says that he prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. So this means that he's kind of an expert in wine. He's really good at tasting wines and knowing what kind of wine they are and knowing what is a good wine versus a bad wine, what you should spend money on or not. Um, so he is good at that. Um, and then I also see this here where it says, in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. So that kind of, again, gives us this idea that Fortunato really knows his wines and can really tell one from the other. We also learn something about the narrator here. He says, in this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. So I'm going to highlight that in pink also, because that also tells me that the narrator also enjoys wine and is very um, good at uh, telling, you know, what is good wine or bad wine. And it tells me that he buys a lot of wine. So this leads us to the question here, what is Fortunato's expertise? So hopefully from that um, exercise in highlighting, you can tell that his expertise is in wine. Fortunato is an expert in tasting wines and um, evaluating them, we'll say, okay? So that's all we're gonna get through for today is uh, slides three and four. So once you're done with those, you are done for the day. If you would like to keep reading, you're welcome to read slides five and slide six, um, but we will continue reading on, um, let's see, the next time that we have class. So please let me know if you have any questions. And again, if you want to work ahead, you're welcome to look at uh, slide five and slide six.